G'day, Pastor Blake here. Thanks so much for watching this message today. I pray that this sermon and resource would help grow you in your relationship with Jesus, also in conjunction with a local church. If you have any questions about our church, you can head to our website, devonportcoc.com.au. Again, thanks for watching this message today, and I do hope that it blesses you in your love and devotion towards Jesus Christ. Can I start today by getting a quick show of hands? Hands up if you are someone who likes roller coasters. And I'm aware that I might be asking this at the wrong service. So, look, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with roller coasters. I love the idea that I am someone who loves roller coasters, but then I have to get on one. A few years ago, Emma and I went to Queensland for a conference and we had a couple of extra days at the start, so we thought, we're on the Gold Coast, we need to do one of the theme parks. And so we got there and we tried to work out which ride we were gonna go on first. Now, even though we'd been married for a few years, I was still wanting to impress, so I didn't really wanna let on that I was starting to second guess myself. But Emma was keen. So we started with the Tower of Terror. <laughs> and uh, it was there that I learned my problem with roller coasters. See, I learned that I don't like to not be in control. And you don't have any control on a roller coaster. You just have to go where it wants to go, forwards or backwards, side to side, upside down, stop and go wherever it wants to. So I did what any rational person would do. I discovered something that I could control, screaming. Or in my case, the lack thereof. If you got a picture of my face on roller coasters, it would look something like this. <laughs> As I am trying so hard to not make any noise whatsoever to not scream because while I couldn't control what the roller coaster did, I could control what came out of my mouth. Mostly, there were a few squeaks that leaked out. Now, the thing about roller coasters and the thing that I learned about I like to be in control, that's a lot like life. See, there are so many things that happen in life and when we get scared or worried, we start to try to control them. We spend our lives saying to God, you take the wheel, God, you're in control, and then as soon as a bump or a turn comes up, we grab control of that wheel back. We try to control people, we try to control the problems that come up, we try to control where we go, but so often we end up leaving the track completely because we find out we are not meant to be the ones in control. We're in the middle of our spiritual growth campaign for 2022, and it is called One Month to Live. We've been challenging ourselves to live this month as if it is our last, not because we are expecting to die at the end of this month, but because we want to reframe our priorities for life. We want to change our lives to what really matters and what is really important. And in this campaign, there are four principles that we are exploring that help us to live the, with the right kind of mindset for life and for God. We've heard about living passionately. And last week, Blake unpacked loving completely for us. And if you've missed any of this series, then I'd encourage you, go to YouTube or our church website, check out the podcast, check out the videos on YouTube and catch up. But today, I wanna unpack the third principle of this one month to live mindset. And this is an important and a powerful principle, but it's also one of the more difficult ones for people to live out. See, the third principle is we need to learn humbly because when I learn humbly, God fills me with his power. And our key passage for, to, for today is Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. 
And it says this, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There are two words that I want to pull out of that passage and focus on. The first is humbled. Jesus humbled himself. And the second is obedient. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient. Humility and obedience go hand in hand. But the thing about humility is so often we misunderstand what it actually is. We, we see humility as putting ourselves down. Oh, no, 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 I'm not very good at that. Oh, no, I'm no good. I, I couldn't possibly do that. Oh, I've got no skills in that area. When in actual fact, you are the one who has the most skills in the room. See, putting yourself down, underselling yourself like that, that's not humility. It's actually probably just low self-esteem. Humility is about placing yourself under the authority of someone and obeying them. As a Christian, humility is about understanding that if I have accepted God to be my Lord and my Savior, if I have put God as the authority of my life, therefore, I need to actually obey him. I need to follow him. I need to be obedient to what he calls me to do, even if I don't think that it's actually the best idea. I need to not take control of the wheel again, but instead I need to allow God to be in control. And what happens after Jesus demonstrates his humility through obedience? God exalts him. God lifts him up. This is the reversal of the kingdom of God. When we humble ourselves under God's authority, he will lift us up. But if we try to raise ourselves up, if we try and do things in our own strength, in our own power, God finds a way to humble us. And I'm sure if you think about that principle, you can see times in your own life where that is what has happened. So this is what the third principle is. We need to learn humbly. We need to learn to let go of the steering wheel, allow God to be in control not us. I can remember the first time that I was chosen to speak at a holiday camp for Camp Clayton. I was given the junior boys camp, one of the hardest groups to engage. And this was a new role. So I knew that I would need help. So I sought God. I gave everything to God for this camp. And the studies were awesome, thanks to God. There were The boys loved them. They engaged with the Bible. There were young people who gave their lives to Christ at that camp. I was humble beneath God's authority because I knew that I needed his help, because I knew I couldn't do it in my own strength. And so God blessed what I did. Well, I was asked to study lead again another camp. This time it was a grade three, four mixed camp. But this time I tried to raise myself up. I tried to do it in my strength, my ideas, my thoughts. And, well, let's just say that that camp didn't go as smoothly as the junior boys camp did. God used that to remind me who needs to have the steering wheel. See, Jesus humbled himself by being obedient to God, and God therefore raised him up. And so we need to learn this principle of learning humbly so that we can step into what God has for us, so that we can step into the, the things that God is calling us to do, so that we can do them with his power and his strength. And the great thing is, there are so many examples in God's word of us seeing this principle at work that we can learn from. And there are three key things that we need to learn if we want to learn humbly. And the first one is this, I need to learn from my losses. 
This is an example that we can see in the Apostle Peter. Now this year we've got the theme of no regrets and Peter's been showing up an awful lot. I'm starting to think that maybe God has something that he wants me to learn from his life. But Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends and Jesus gave Peter the name Peter, which means rock, because he was the disciple that he wanted to build his church upon. And yet at the Last Supper, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He tells them, you are about to face the most difficult circumstances yet. You're going to lose all hope. And Peter declares into that moment, no matter what these other guys do, I will stay true. But as we've already heard this year, that's not what happened. Peter didn't stay true. He denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed the next morning, just as Jesus predicted. And then we see in Luke 22, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will, dis you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is a picture of a regret. This is a picture of loss and of failure. Jesus didn't have to say anything to Peter because Peter already felt it so completely in himself. Guilt, shame, regret. Peter knew that he had taken the wheel from Jesus. He tried to do things himself. And you know, I reckon that there are some people in the room today who are right there where Peter was. Your wheels have left the road because you've grabbed the steering wheel. You feel like your life has derailed. You might feel like your marriage is heading that way, that your business is on two wheels and things aren't looking good. But Jesus looks at you in the middle of all your losses, in the middle of those failures, and he sees you and he wants to tell you the same thing that he wanted to tell Peter. I am the God of second chances. I have a plan and a purpose for your life. You haven't ruined that, but you need to learn from this. Because we all fail. We all have losses. We all have times when we don't succeed. But not everyone in life learns from it. Some people stay there. Some people sit in their losses and their failures and they just stay there and they complain. But that's not what Peter did. He stepped into what God had for him as the leader of the church and he was able to do it because he practiced two important things. First one, I take responsibility for my failures. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. When we fail, our instinct is to put the blame out there somewhere. We want to blame circumstances outside of us. There was too much happening. The, the deadlines of this project meant that I couldn't focus on what was happening over there. My boss didn't actually tell me. Where was I? Thank you. See, that was just a test to see if you guys were listening. See, so often we want to blame it on other people. My boss didn't actually tell me how important that project was. My partner didn't remind me that we had this event happening, this event coming up. If we want to learn from our losses, then the first thing that we need to do is we actually have to take responsibility 
for our failures. Peter had been on a long journey with Jesus about pride, about boasting. Peter had thought himself better than the other disciples. They might fall away, God, but I'm not going to fall away. I'm going to stay true. He, he kind of thought that Jesus was blessed to have him on the team, that Jesus needed him. After all, he was the one that was willing to speak encouragement to Jesus and tell Jesus off for saying he needed to die. So when, G- when Peter caught Jesus' eye across the courtyard and he had disowned Jesus, he knew that he had failed. He knew that he had made a mistake and stuffed up. And he knew this was not anyone else's fault. He took responsibility for his failures. And in doing so, Peter's pride was, he killed a killing blow. It took a killing blow. And this is what is actually needed because God doesn't want to use us if we are full of pride. He can use us, but he doesn't want to use us when we're full of pride because if we're full of pride, we're just going to say we did it in our strength. We did it on our own, in our power. See, something that we can often misunderstand about God is that God doesn't actually need us. God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to be involved in what he is doing to to share in his work. He has chosen us to belong to him and to do good things, but God doesn't need us. So when Peter encountered Jesus across the courtyard, he realized his failure. He thought that he had blown all his chances to serve God, to be used by God, when in actual fact, this was the time that God wanted to use Peter. Because Peter knew that he couldn't do it himself. And so now he got out of the passenger seat and he allowed God to drive. We need to take responsibility for our failures. We need to own up to it, even though it's hard and even though our pride will take a beating. But that's a good thing. Because in that moment, we are reminded that while God doesn't need us, He wants us, and he still invites us to be part of what he's doing. And the second key to learning from our losses is, I let go of my guilt. There are two so incredibly important words in Peter's story, and we see them on Easter Sunday as the women go to the tomb to visit Jesus. We see them recorded in Mark chapter 16, verse 7. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. This angel let the women know that Jesus was no longer there, but he was alive. The angel made sure that Peter knew he was included with the call to get the disciples. These are powerful words because so often the hardest person for us to forgive is ourself. When we finally take responsibility for our failures, we don't like to let ourselves off the hook after that. God had dealt with Peter's pride problem, but now it was time for him to make sure that Peter knew even though God didn't need him for what he was doing, he'd chosen Peter. He wanted Peter to be involved in what he was doing. See, so often we can continue to feel guilty over what we have already confessed to God about. We have repented of it. We have given it to God. But we still feel guilty. That's pride talking. Because when we confess our sins to God, when we seek his forgiveness, and then we continue to live in that guilt and with that guilt, What we're actually saying is we know more about forgiveness than God. That our standards are higher than God's. That we are greater than God. That our holiness is greater than God's. And I don't think that there's anybody here in this room today that would actually believe that. 
When we confess our sins to God, we need to put that guilt down and let go of it. But I 100% know how hard that can be at times. And many of you have heard me preach about the challenge of putting down guilt before. But God is calling on us to let go of the guilt once we have confessed it. To let go of it, to remember that we follow the God of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, thousand chances. And he is inviting us to be involved in what he is doing today. So the first way that we can put, learn to learn humbly is we need to learn from our losses. The second is I surrender to God's strength. Our failures and our weaknesses are important. Without those, we allow pride to get in the way. And we would keep trying to take back control of the steering wheel from God. This series is about making sure that we live with good priorities, with the right priorities. It's about trying to live the way that God intended us to live, to live without regrets. When we try to control the wheel, we can't do that. So we actually have to surrender that to God. And Paul is somebody in the Bible who learned this lesson well. He had a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what this thought in the flesh was. It might have been poor eyesight. It might have been an injury that Paul had that God refused to heal. It could have been so many different things. But Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he describes in this letter how this thorn affected him. In fact, he describes this thorn as a messenger of Satan. This is something that really frustrated Paul. This is something that he struggled with. This wasn't something small. This was something that just kept coming back and frustrating what he was trying to do. And Paul says that three times he pleaded with God, take this away. He didn't pray, take it away. He didn't just ask God to take it away. Three times he pleaded with God. He begged God, take this away. And yet Paul heard God speak back. And we hear the response recorded in verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. God's power is made perfect in weakness. If we want to learn humbly, we need to understand that God wants to use us in our weaknesses. It is our weaknesses, our humanity that reveals it is the power of God that's working in us. You know, I can remember back in college, I started to really struggle with anxiety. I became incredibly anxious. I was worried every time that I left my house or left a room, I was worried that I was going to say something stupid. I was worried that I was going to do something stupid. I was worried that I would forget some basic social skills or social cues and I would just make a massive faux pas, a massive stuff up and everybody would just look at me and be horrified. I remember it got to the point where every time I left a room, every time I prepared to go to another class, every time I prepared to go to another building or location or to do anything different, I would need to pray. God, I need you. God, I need your help. God, help me to do this. God, I can't do this on my own. God, I need your strength. A thousand prayers throughout the day. And the reason that I share that is this. 
those years in college, that time struggling with anxiety, with those anxious thoughts, it built a habit in me, a habit knowing that I am weak, but God is strong. I learned in those times to rely on God, and I also learned in those times that God could and would and wanted to use me for his will. God used me to speak truth into people's lives who couldn't see it for themselves. He used me to grow and encourage others. God used me to save a life. He used me in so many ways, me, someone who was fearful of saying or doing the wrong thing every single time I left my house. God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. But in order for that to happen, we have to get rid of pride. We have to learn from our losses. And then... We need to choose to surrender. We need to understand that God wants to use us even though we are weak. Even in our mistakes, we need to understand that he has the strength to do what we don't have the strength to do. Our weaknesses enable us to depend on God and to therefore develop a richness of relationship with him. So we learn from our losses. We surrender to God's strength. The last key to implementing this principle of living humbly is I pursue God's path. And this is probably the most important part of living according to God's will and purposes. In fact, without this, the other steps don't really help much. After all, we can learn from our mistakes, but if we're not careful, we can learn the wrong lessons. And we can acknowledge all we want that we need God's strength. But if we continue to seek the wrong thing with that, it remains worthless. So the third part of learning to live humbly and thereby allowing ourselves to live out of God's power is to pursue God's path. We need to choose to humble ourselves by giving up the fact that we know best. We need to remove from ourselves the option of following God when times are good and then taking back control of the wheel as soon as we hit a bump. The passage that I started this sermon off today was Philippians 2, verses 8 to 10. And in it, we are shown that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient, obedient even to death on a cross. Jesus followed the will of God. He pursued God's path, but pursuing God's path doesn't mean that we don't struggle with it at times. After all, Jesus wrestled with this. In the garden before Jesus was arrested, he prayed at least twice, desperately seeking another way. And in fact, in Luke's account, we read the following words. And being in anguish, He prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus wrestled with what it meant to pursue God's path. But at the same time, he demonstrated humility by being obedient to God. Not my will, God, but yours. Jesus pursued the path that God had placed before him. And if there was anyone who could argue with the Father, it would be Jesus. And yet he was humble. He was obedient. It was in that place of pursuing the path that God had laid for him that Jesus was exalted and lifted up by God. It was through pursuing that path that a way was made so that we can follow God, to be reunited to that relationship with God that was broken. We are called to follow Jesus, to walk in his footsteps, to follow his example, to pursue God's path. 
And the questions that come with this are the same questions that I ask people when I talk to them about getting baptised or when they tell me that they want to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Are you willing to stop doing the things in your life that Jesus asks you to stop? Even if it might not make sense to you? Even if you like doing it? And are you willing to step out and do the things that Jesus calls you to do? Even though they might be hard. Even though you might feel uncomfortable doing it. Even though you might be pushed out of your comfort zone. Are you willing to do what God has called you to do? Because that's what it means to pursue God's path. That's what it means to learn humbly. It means stopping and allowing God to have control of the steering wheel of your life. Because humility and obedience go hand in hand. And humility means being obedient to another authority. And so the question as I finish today is simple. Are you able to live your life learning humbly? To submit yourself to God? Because it's hard. But when we surrender that to Jesus, there is a blessing that we encounter that spills over into the rest of our lives. And we also find a life that matters.